Hi, hello everybody. It's good to be here with you again. Welcome to the third workshop on inflammation. Um, this is this afternoon session is the Emerging Young Scientist session, and it's my pleasure to be hosting this um, room, which will be the where we'll have the oral communications from undergraduate students. So I'm very happy to be here because. Uh, First of all, to congratulate these students, and it's, it has been a real pleasure to have a great engagement from um, so young students, um, which are the beginning and the force of the scientific uh, formation in Brazil. Um, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Rodrigo Tinoco, if Rodrigo can show up here. So um, we'll both be hosting the presentation and let's congratulate the five students who will present their um, works. So we'll have Mateus Macedo Monteiro, Theo Vasconcelos, Nicolas de Souza, Luiz Gustavo Albertoni, and Fernanda Cunha. So congratulations to you all. Uh, and we'll start the presentations. The students will present in 10 minutes and then we'll proceed with the questions. Um, so now let me address the you who are watching us. You are welcome to, to write your question in Portuguese if you need to, but I'll try to translate the question into English and they will try to answer in English, okay? So if, you, if you're if you okay writing and uh, asking your question in English, uh, it's preferable since we are um, in an international uh, event, but uh, we are really here to engage you all, so do not uh, refrain yourselves from asking questions because of the language, right? So thank you all again, and we'll start with Fernanda. Hello, everyone. First, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to show you the work I did as a conclusion to graduate. We mean here to investigate the role of IL-8 in tissue factor mediated progression of human breast carcinoma. The reason for this project is that TF first known for its ability to active blood coagulation has also been detected at the membrane of different types of cancer cells, including breast cancer. And its expression is positively correlated to tumor aggressiveness and poor prognosis. In addition to its role in blood coagulation, TF is known to induce an uh, intercellular signaling pathway leading to production of several factors among which IL-8 has attracted our attention. Since the chemokine has been described to contribute to several aspects of tumor progression, in the first part of my work, we aim to investigate the role of TF in the release of factors that promote protumor effects in different types of cells of tumor microenvironment. For this, we used the breast cancer cell line of aggressive phenotype named MDA and B deuterium cells, or just MDA from now on, which comes from a highly metastatic human tumor of the basal subtype of breast cancer. These cells express high levels of TF and IL-8 proteins. We also benefit from the work of PhD student of Dr. Robson Monteiro's lab, who established a 
cellular counterpart of MGA cells silenced for TF. The characterization of silenced cell line showing the efficient of TF silence and no difference in the proliferation rate between both cell lines. To work the role of TF in release of factor that may favor the acquisition of per tumor features in tumor mass, we evaluated the effect of conditioned media or just TN from now on, obtaining for both MDA cells lines on human neutrophil as well as on body aggressive breast cancer cells. Originated from a not metastatic human tumor of luminal subtype, MCF7 cells are known to express low TF and IL8 proteins. The intention here was to see if this here capable to get more aggressive features in response to CN from MDA cells. As we use it, CN from high TF expressing MDA cells to treat MCF7 cells, we observed fast alteration of its cellular morphology compatible with the loss of epithelial features, significant uh, increase of its migration capacity and of CXCL8 gene expression. When the, we use the CM from TF silence the MDA cells, MDA cells, MCF7 cells showed similar but less marked morphological change for increase its migration capacity and no significant stimulation of CX CXCLH gene expression. This first result suggests that factors released by high TF expression MDA cells are able to induce aggressive factors in MCF7 cells and that TF silencing is sufficient to abolish most of the pro-tumor effects we observed. We next used CM from MDA cells to treat human neutrophils isolated from blood of patients healthily. And showed that CM from high TF expressing MDA cells greatly camo attacked neutrophils and that the silence of reduced these effects. We then analyzed the capacity of MDA cells, CM to activate the human neutrophils by observing its capacity to induce the formation of extracellular neutrophil traps, referred as NETs, in green cytox incorporation assay, and observe, observed that CM from both MDL cells line seems to have a similar capacity to activate the human neutrophils. These results suggest that the factors released by high TF expressing MDA cells are able to uh, chemo attract and activate human neutrophils, and that finally seems to only interfere with neutrophils chemotaxis, but not activation. From the first part of my work, we conclude that the presence of high TF at the membrane of aggressive cancer cells can induce a release of factor that pr promotes the acquisition of pro-tumor features by different types of cells that constitute the breast cancer microenvironment. Well, in the second part of my word, we asked if IL8 could be a good candidate to mediate TF induced protumor effects. We characterize it. When analyzed basal expression of the CXCL8 gene and IL8 released by both MDA cell lines, and observed that TF silence abolish one another. When we concluded that TF is mostly responsible for this release of high IL8 by MDA cells. In order to evaluate 
if our in vitro results could be a transposer to human breast tumor in patients, we used uh, transcriptomic data from human breast carcinoma, the post data in the public TCGA database. We observed that F3 and CXLH genes tend to be highly expressed in aggressive basal subtypes of breast cancer when compared to less aggressive luminal subtypes. We also could, be, could see a positive correlation between F3 and CXLH gene expression with a high uh, spearman correlation coefficient being observed for the aggressive basal subtype. Finally, we analyzed a set of genes defined as a neutrophil-related signature in different breast cancer subtypes and observed a positive correlation of F3 genes with four neutrophil marks for all subtypes as well as for basal subtype groups. We also noted positive correlation of two neutrophil marks that are specific to basal subtype, as well as a strengthening of a spearman correlation coefficient for CKM6 gene from uh, all subtype to basal subtype groups. From part two of my work, we conclude that most aggressive human breast carcinoma associated with poor prognosis tend to express higher levels of, T of TF and correlate with high ILH and enhanced intertumoral neutrophils accumulation. Altogether, our results suggest that the presence of high TF expressing tumor cells may contribute by secretion in the microenvironment to progression of the tumor mass, possible providing high ILAT levels. Sorry. I did like to thank the lab team, especially my professor Sandra and the professor Hobson group. Thank you for your attention, and that's it. Thank you, Fernanda. This is an excellent uh, presentation. So I'd like to see if there are questions. Oh, I think I have to, uh, I can see this mode, sorry. Um, I can, uh, I see no questions in from the audience. I'd like to call um, professor Rodrigo Tinoco. Hi, Fernanda. First, first, uh, I would like to to tell you that you had a, a, a great, a nice talk, and your work was very good. And congratulations for your presentation. It was also very clear. I'd like to know if, he, if, for example, you show show it that. Uh, uh, tissue factors expressing tumors are able to induce the production of iolate and, and chemotaxis of neutrophils. Uh, did you uh, perform your experiments in the presence of human plasma? Because I imagine that tissue factor was activating the coagulation, the clotting uh, 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 cascade. So uh, at, at the end, uh, you would observe the formation of the activation of thrombin. For example, do you think uh, tissue factor is activating the production of IL-8 by the, the formation of thrombin, of, by the f formation of active thrombin? Well, uh, thanks for the 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 question and i i can talk in portuguese spell in portuguese yes um yes <laughs> thank you uh bom é, normalmente a gente percebe o tf realmente é é bastante conhecido né sobre tf na coagulação 
E o que a gente sabe de alguns artigos, na verdade, na literatura, é que é, o TF está contido em membrana de, de, algumas, de, de algumas células do, de câncer, inclusive no câncer de mama, e ele é mediado pelo PAR2. Então, parece que existe uma, uma relação, é, uma correlação bem próxima. É, não precisamente mais, é, não precisamente no caso da trombina, mas o PAR2, ele está ali para mediar essa, essa ativação de L8 pelo, pelo TF. O que a gente viu é que realmente em alguns artigos eles... Alguns dizem que a trombina é realmente um, um, um dos fatores importantes, mas outros não. Então, a gente acredita, é, segundo os nossos artigos de referência, é que realmente é uma ativação via PAR2, ERC, mapquinase, até a produção realmente da IL-8. Ok. Então, você acha que uma outra protease poderia be... ser... Uh, acting by the activation of PAR2 instead of thrombin. Uh, eu li em, em alguns artigos de referência é que a própria é, TF por ter é, por ser uma proteína é, de dois domínios eu acho que ela se eu não me engano ela consegue ativar a, o partiu ativamente ela se liga ao, ao partiu e, e ativa essa sinalização independente de uma outra proteína. But in your system, do you have human plasma? I mean, a, a source of thrombin. Do you have human plasma in, in your experiments in the, the medium of the, the cancer breast cells? No, my experiment... <laughs> Meus experimentos, eles contam com linhagens celulares de, do câncer de mama e, enfim, eu não utilizei a trombina para verificar essa sinalização, mas é, nós acreditamos que, que é, existe essa associação, então, entre o TF por, e, e PAR2, ligando o IL-8. É, trabalhos anteriores do grupo também é, mostraram através da ativação de, de TF par 2 gerando o IL-8 por via de é, ERC, é, na qual é, quando o par 2 foi silenciado, a gente via então que é, IL-8 é, reduzia a sua o seu a sua expressão mas quando é, isso eu digo da, da sinalização toda né então TF par 2 e L8 se eu silencio o par 2 dessa de alguma forma dessa dessa é, dessa sinalização eu tenho então com baixo TF baixo L8 e, e enfim me parece ser regulado sim essa regulação parece ser bem, bem forte, assim, entre TF par 2 e, e TF e L8. Ok. I, I would like to, to make your suggestion. Ah, ok. okay. So have... make your suggestion. I think we have no more time for additional questions, but you can okay. make a suggestion, of course. Oh, I, I think you, you should observe the formation of neutrophil uh, DNA extracellular traps because nets yes. are involved in the progression of and metastasis of some tumors. And, and, and you have an interesting cell line that does not produ produce a tissue factory. It would be interesting to know if, the, if tissue factory is required for the induction of formation of uh, nets uh, by human neutrophils, for example. I think it, it would be a, a good idea for the progression of your work. Okay, Fernando? Okay. Once more, uh, uh, congratulations. It was a, a nice talk. You had a, a, an excellent work. Your work is very good. Okay? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank That's you again, Fernanda. Thank you, Rodrigo.
Uh, so let's proceed with our next presentation. I think we have Luis Gustavo now. Am I right? It's me. So congratulations, Luis Gustavo, once again. Thank you very much. Can I start it already? Sure. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Luis Gustavo, and I am a veterinary medicine student at the Federal University of Juiz de Fora. And I participate on the initiation, on the scientific initiation program at the same university. And my contribu contribution to this workshop is the work entitled Modulation of Macrophage Activation by Factors Secreted by NIH 3T3 L1 Adipocytes During Infection by Mycobacterium Bobbs BCG in vitro which was carried out with the collaboration of the master Ana Luisa da Silva Bertoni under the guidance of the professor and Dr. Patricia Eleni Jalnit. Well, to introduce this work, we need to remember that obesity is one of the main public health problems in the world, according to the WHO, and is considered a chronic and multifactorial disease characterized by excessive accumulation of body fat and decreased of energy expenditure which results in adipocyte, in adipocyte tissue hypertroph hypertrophy, and it's usually associated with other health problems. In addiction to excess body fat, obesity is characterized by a low-grade inflammatory state, also called meta-inflammation, which was defined as a chronic low-grade inflammatory state in response to the excess of nutrients. In meta-inflammation, a series of cytosines and adipocines are produced by adipocytes, resulting in a long-lasting activation of the immune system. The macrophages are one of the main cell of, of, is one of the main cell types found in this inflamed tissue. And in a situation of meta-inflammation, the macrophages and the adipocytes are responsible by a process of signaling and interaction known as crosstalking, that increases the secretion of several sol soluble factors that amplify the meta-inflammation process. In this soluble factor, several cytosines, adipocines, and the extracellular vesicles are found, which will play a role in cell migration and cell activation. And, and also in the macrophage profile. This release of soluble factors increases in obesity, and the extracellular vesicles secreted among these factors secreted by adipocytes are divided into two subpopulations, the microvesicles and the exosomes. The adipocytes that make part of the crosstalking undergo differentiation through pathways from transcriptional factors, such as PPR, PPAR gamma. These transcriptional factors play a fundamental role. PPAR gamma is a nuclear receptor activated by lipid ligands which was in numerous immunoregulatory properties uh, in the macrophage function and adipocyte differentiation. PPR gamma specific ligands are highly active, uh, sorry, uh, induce the expression of the lipid bodies. And the lipid bodies uh, are highly active cytoplasmic organelles that play a role in the lipid metabolism and storage synthesis of inflammatory mediators, cell signaling, and function as sites for survival of pathogens. And the, uh, the MBOBs uh, induces the formation of these lipid bodies through TLR2 and CD36 that activate the PPR gamma pathway that induce the lipid bodies in situations of infection. So, our main goal is investigate the relationship between factors secreted by adipocytes, the FSA, such as cytosines, adipocines, and extracellular vesicles, in micro macrophage activation during the infection by the intracellular pathogen, Mycobacterium bovis BCG in vitro. Uh, as our methods, we first perform the differentiation of 3T3 L1 adipocytes, then collect their supernatant contained the soluble factors secreted by the adipocytes, and we also collected the peritoneal macrophages. Then perform the infection, followed by the stimulation with soluble factors and the extracellular vesicles. Soon after, 
And these samples were taken for analysis of cytosines and lipid bodies. As our first result, we had the differentiation of precursor cells from NYH3T3L1 lineage. As we see in these images, the cells are enlonged uh, with a large and abundant cytoplasm, large nucleus, and also with extension. After 17 days, the cells presented typical characteristics of adipocytes. The figure A so shows the morphology of undifferentiated 3T3L1 cells, and the photo B shows the morphology of already differentiated adipocytes. We also have analysis in this, uh, of these adipocytes in fluorescence microscopy and light microscopy. In the graph, we can see that the lipid body's concentration increase in the differentiated cells. Um, next, we analyze the biogenesis of lipid bodies in macrophages stimulated with adipocyte secreted factors, the FSA, and infected or not with Mycobacterium bovis BCG. At the three times, uh, 6, 24, and 48 hours, mycobacterial infection was able to induce lipid body formation when compared to the control group. Interesting, we can see that the FSA itself, uh, itself uh, has able to induce the lipid body formation also. However, the BCG group in the presence of the FCA had the biogenesis of lipid bodies potentialized when compared to the unstimulated group. Also is confirmed by the fluorescence microscope images. Um, as already showed, the BCG group induced the formation of lipid bodies when compared to the control group, an event that was potentialized uh, that was potentialized by the FSA. Uh, <clears throat> and the treatment with GW9662, which was an inhibitor of the PPR gamma, however, was able to inhibit the formation of the lipid bodies in both FSA stimulated and not stimulated. <clears throat> As you can see and in the images right and uh, right here. We will now analyze the production of cytosine in stimulated or not stimulated macrophages with FSA and infected or not with Mycobacterium bovis BCG. By the ELISA assay, we observe that the presence of BCG infection induced the production of TNF alpha when compared to the control group. However, this effect appears to be inhibited in the presence of FCA. As for EL10 level, EL levels, we found no significantly difference between the BCG group and the control groups, both unstimulated with FSA. However, the infection in the presence of FCA stimulation seem, seemed to stimulate significantly greater production of this cytosine. We also evaluate the levels of adiponectin in cultures of macrophages stimulated with FAA or not and infected with MBOVS BCG or not. True on ELISA say at the signs of 6, 24, and 48 hours, as we can see from the graphs, the unstimulated groups produced on the TECPO levels when compared to the FSA stimulated groups when the production of this adipocene was high in the control group at the three times analyzed. We investigate the profile of TNF-alpha and KC cytosines after stimulation of peritoneal macrophages with FCA with treatment with PPR gamma antagonist and infected with BCG. According to the graph, TNF-alpha production was significantly in the face of BCG infection when compared to the control group, but negatively modulation when treated with GW. 9662. In addiction, the cytosine was negative modulated in the presence of, of FSA stimulation and infection. Uh, for the KC synthesis, we noticed that cytosine synthesis was greater in the infected group and when compared to the control and stimulated with GW9662. Uh, it was, sorry, in the presence of GW, it was potentialized. 
<clears throat> uh, when sampled with uh, with FSA, FSA expression uh, increased significantly. Uh, after performing this analysis, we noticed that FSA positively modulates the biogenesis of lipid bodies and also the expression of cytosines. Therefore, something present in this factor is uh, something present in this in these factors uh, as responsible for for positive for positive um, modulation. So we started to think about how, what would be in, the, in this FSA that potentializes this biogenesis. Mariette et al. says that extracellular vesicles and their subpopulations released by human adipocytes or adipocyte tissue explants play a role in the paracne interaction between adipocytes and macrophages, a key mechanism in adipose tissue inflammation and leads to metabolic complications. Um, therefore, we purified and isolated the subpopulations of the extracellular vesicles through flow cytometry, nanodrop, and mainly zetacizer. And as we can see in the images uh, of the graphs, we started to stimulate the samples with microvesicles and exosomes to evaluate their action. The infect with BCG potentialized the formation of the lipid bodies in the presence of both stimulus with the microvesicles and the exosomes when compared to the BCG group not stimulated uh, with, the, with the vesicles. Even the treatment with microvesicles and exosomes in absence of the infection are also able to induce the biogenesis of lipid bodies, as you can see in here, when compared to the uninfected and the unstimulated groups. So in the infected and stimulated, the production of lipid bodies was bigger, and the microvesicles, in absence of infection, is capable to induce the formation of lipid bodies. <clears throat> so we can see uh, so we can see them, uh, two in this graphic. So we investigate the profile of KC cytosine as treatment of peritoneal macrophages with microvesicles and exosomes isolated from the FSA. The production of KC appears to be downmodulated when BCG infection is associated, like here, and to stimulate uh, in the production is association to stimulate with the vesicles after, when compared to the control to the group only stimulated with the microvesicles that was very, very bigger and not infected. Uh, as our conclusions, our results suggest that FSA has an important role on BCG infected macrophages that is attributed attribute to the formation of LBs, PPR gamma expression synthesis of cytosines and adipocines, which can contribute to change in the polarization state. In addiction, and in addiction, we also have the presence of the extracellular vesicles in adipocyte secreted factors, inducing the lipid bodies biogenesis and also cytosine expression. Finally, I would like to thank everyone to make this work possible. My colleagues from the Cell Biology Laboratory of the Federal University of Jewish Fora, Ana Luisa, Poliani, Remy, the Dr. Eloisa Davila, and especially Dr. Patricia Lani de Almeida. And, and also thank you, Dr. Patricia Torres Boza of the Instituto Oswaldo Cruz, the organizers for this event, for the opportunity, and also, also the listeners for their attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gustavo. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, um, I see no questions from the audience. I'll call Rodrigo. We are a little short of time, but we still have time for questions, of course. Hi, Luis Gustavo. Uh, first, Hello. congratulations. You you have a, a nice talk and you have uh, excellent results, very interesting results. Well, which mechanism do you think is involved in the, the uh, formation of lipid, bo lipid bodies induced by uh, a microvesicle, extracellular microvesicles produced by adipocytes. Um, do you listen to me? Are you listening? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, 
So first, I want to thank you for the for the presentation. And well, the microvesicles are secreted by adipocytes. And so, in let just me just me think a little. <clears throat> can I can also answer in Portuguese? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, então, as, as, micro, as vesículas extracelulares, né, como eu disse, elas desempenham um papel muito importante na, na inflamação do tecido adiposo em si, e elas são, assim, extremamente importantes para essa sinalização, esse, esse cross-talking entre macrófago e, e, o, e os adipócitos. No nosso trabalho em si, a gente ainda não teve, não teve, assim, a gente ainda não chegou a... A estudar, de, a estudar a fundo qual é o mecanismo dessas microvesículas na, na, na formação desses lipidibores. Mas, assim, o que a gente tem pensado é possivelmente que as, micro, as vesículas extracelulares, elas ativam possivelmente uma via é, TLR2, né, uma via TAL2, que vai ativar a via do PPAR gama, que vai induzir a formação do, do, dos corpos lipídicos, né, dos lipidibores. Então, a gente tem as, as vesículas extracelulares, elas ativam uma via TAL2, de TLR2, e assim ativa a via do PPAR gama, que é o responsável pela indução do, do corpúsculo lipídico, lipídico frente a uma infecção patológica intracelular. Mas a gente ainda vai buscar, vai buscar, né, vai ser o próximo passo do nosso estudo, né? A yeah. gente pesquisa isso mais a fundo. Yeah, you, you, it would be interesting to to evaluate the composition of the microvesicles. For example, I, I think it's the, you are thinking on it by as a, your next steps. Uh, for example, to make uh, lipidomics and and uh, proteomics of the microvesicles in a way to characterize the 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 molecules that are modulating the formation of lip, lipid bodies by infected macrophages. Uh, well, yes, we we going to do a proteomic study in the next stage. This is already this already deal with the lab. We going to do a, a proteomic study in the next step of the study. Okay. Thank you, Luis Gustavo. Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, we're a little short of time and we're going to proceed. But if you have additional questions, you can write them uh, on your comments and we'll pass them on to the presenter and then they can ask you back. Okay. Uh, so now, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I got a little lost here. I don't know who is the next one. So maybe you can help me. I think it's Mateus Monteiro. Yes. So, uh, congratulations. Thank you. Good afternoon. So, uh, I want to thank you, Professor Rosani, for the introduction. And I also want to thank the, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to present my, my research for you guys today. And so, the, the research that I'll be sharing with you uh, look at the endothelial oxidative stress and the antioxidant profile doing schistosomiasis. So, uh, schistosomiasis is a neglected tropical disease which affects more than 2 million people worldwide. And in Brazil, the, the disease is caused by schistosoma mansoni, schistosoma mansoni. So, uh, schistosomiasis is an intravascular disease. Uh, so, briefly, the, the parasite uh, penetrates the, the host skin and, and they gain the cardiovascular system where they grow into all the worms and the parasitic uh, establishes in the mesenteric veins where they put, they put eggs and uh, this disease has some target organs uh, like uh, the liver, mesentery and lungs. And in these organs, there are characteristics of inflammation and uh, a pro-environmental uh, inflammation of these organs. So, uh, it is well known that endothelial cells play an important role in the vascular homeostasis, 
by the mainly by the conductivity uh, nitric oxide synthase that produce and release nitric oxide and that regulates many events uh, and also reduce the leukocytes adhesion to this endothelial monolayer. So uh, our group has already found that uh, in, this, uh, uh, in the cells, in, in animals, in the cells of animals infected with schistotomiasis, the mononuclear, the spontaneous mononuclear adhesion to these uh, endothelial cells is higher in the infected group in, in compared to the control groups. Uh, and also we found that uh, the nitric oxide production uh, uh, with uh, stimulus with bradykinin is reduced in the also uh, reduced in the infected group compared to the to the control group. So uh, these two data are uh, some evidence of endothelial dysfunction. So uh, with, the, with this data together, uh, another source of endothelial dysfunction is the oxidative stress. And this oxidative stress is caused by uh, reactive oxygen species, mainly here the superoxide anion. And these this rods, uh, these reactive oxygen species, uh, uh, the source in the endothelial cells can be by mitochondrial metabolism, can be by exogenous, exogenous, exogenous source, by inflammation cells, leukocytes, and there are some ex specific enzymes that produce superoxide anion, such as NAPGH oxidase, NOx, and these reactive oxygen species can cause damage to the cell, uh, can, can cause lipid peroxidation, but also this, there is a system that detoxify these reactive oxygen species by antioxidant enzymes. So, uh, so uh, we asked ourselves if the oxidative stress contributes to the endothelial, endothelial dysfunction during schistosomiasis. So uh, our, goal, our goal in this study was to investigate the mesenteric endothelial cell, uh, cell oxidative stress and antioxidant profile during schistosomiasis. Uh, quickly, our model worked with two groups, the control group and the schistosomomansone infected mice. Uh, so shortly, uh, the, we, the newborn male mice were, were infected with approximately 80 circadias. Uh, and after 75 to 90 days, we performed the primary the primary culture of the of mesenteric endothelial cells. So as we are working with primary culture, we we want to know if our culture was was uh, in fact endothelial cells. So we do we, we did a cytometric assay, uh, and both both groups of uh, both cells of both groups showed high and similar positive for CD31, that is a, a marker of endothelial cells. Uh, and now we, we evaluated the, the oxidative stress in, in, in our model. So first here, we the, uh, the ROS production, mainly in this cause, uh, superoxide anion, anion. And we, we saw that in the infected group, Compared, there is, there is more ROS production in the infected group compared to the control group. And as a, co as a consequence of this, this oxidative stress, uh, the lipid peroxidation that is shown here by uh, T bars assay. And we also, uh, we also saw an increased lipid peroxidation in the infected group compared to the control group. In this case, uh, the data uh, expressed by Malonge of the height there is a marker of uh, lipid peroxidation. So uh, with this increased uh, oxidative stress, we, we ask ourselves if the, the, the increased leukocyte adhesion could be explained by this reaction. So uh, the increased superoxide anion reacts with ox, oxide nitric, nitric, nitric oxide to form peroxynitrite. And this peroxynitrite can be a, a, another source of oxidative stress. So the superoxide anion could be sequestrating the, the nitric oxide and 
uh, increasing the the adherent cells to the to the endothelial monolayer. So uh, now we we want to investigate this peroxide, uh, peroxide, and we evaluate the the, pro the proteins nitrosylation of our cells. But in this case, the infected group showed uh, a reduced nitrotyrosine residues in the in the proteins. So, uh, but uh, this data could be explained because we also uh, uh, saw uh, a, a reduction of nitric oxide bioavailability in the infected group. So there is uh, less nitric oxide and, uh, and so less formation of peroxynitrite. So with this, the high antioxidant uh, stress, we evaluate now the antioxidant enzymes of, uh, of, of our, our model. So these antioxidant enzymes, as I, as I explained it, detoxifies the, the radicals. And first we evaluated here, the superoxide dismutase one, the SOD, the cytosolic isoform, and we didn't saw any difference between both groups. So uh, further, we evaluated the GPX, the glutathione peroxidase that is, detoxifies another another uh, free radical, but uh, again, we didn't see any difference between both groups. So uh, now, if we didn't see any difference in the expressions of, of these antioxidant enzymes, we evaluated the nuclear factor NRF2 uh, that once activated uh, this nuclear factor travels to nucleus and increased the expression of, of the antioxidant enzymes. So uh, in these results here, I showed uh, there is that we didn't see to, again any difference in the increased expression of this nuclear factor. But uh, and uh, it's important to say that we didn't investigate the, the activated form of the nucleic factor, the, the phosphorylation of the nuclear factor. So uh, in conclusion, to summarize, uh, we conclude that in the in the filial cells of animals infected with schistosomiasis, we saw an increased lipid peroxidation, an increased uh, uh, ROS, mainly superoxide anion, and a reduced uh, bioavailability of nitric oxide. And these, these data uh, are also markers of endothelial dysfunction and inflammation of these cells. So uh, our goal in the future of what we are looking for uh, is to to find the the source of this increased superoxidic annual that can be produced by uh, nitric oxide synthase and coupling that can be produced by activation of the NOx and also we want to evaluate the another another antioxidant enzyme such as catalase and the other other enzymes in isoforms so. Uh, I want to thank the scientific committee for giving me, giving me the opportunity. I will work it in, in the Laboratório de Pharmacologia e Bioquímica Molecular, especially Professor Claudia, uh, also Laboratório de Biologia Redox, Fundação Oswaldo Cruz, uh, especially uh, Dr. Silvana Tiengo for the, the Cercarius. I want to thank you, uh, everyone that is, is seeing, seeing us today. I also want to thank my other colleagues that are presenting. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Matheus. Excellent presentation. You. Let me see if we have questions. Um, again, no. But again, I'll tell you not to refrain from asking questions, either in Portuguese or in English. We can pass them on. Um, so let's have the questions uh, from Dr. Rodrigo Tinoco. Hi, Matheus. Uh, nice talk. Uh, congratulations for your work. Um, I, I have a, a question. I think your results are very interesting, but you, how can I say, you remove the endothelial cells from infected uh, yes. animals. So the, these cells could be, act, probably are being activated during the infection by the inflammatory response for example, by pro-inflammatory cytokines, by leukocytes, 
for example, do you have do, do you think uh, the inflammatory response has a role in the the generation of uh, react, reactive oxygen species by the endothelial cells in your system? For example, if you remove neutrophils by depletion of specific depletion of neutrophils or uh, for example, uh, neutralization of an anti-inflammatory cytokine, for example, TNF, do you think you could uh, uh, reduce this oxidative stress in endothelial cells during the infection? Um, maybe, and also uh, not the, even the cytokines, but uh, the parasite stays in, into the vascular the vascular vessel, so the, the, the parasite can produce uh, cytokines, but also in our model, we worked with uh, animals uh, 75 to 90 days post-infection. So in this case, uh, the model was to establish most of a chronic inf infection because the disease uh, has two, well, uh, uh, how I can show you, two, uh, two profiles. The first was TH TH1 prevalent, that is most pro-inflammatory, like with uh, cytokines like TNF uh, and in interleukines. But the second one that when I do the, the culture, is most TH2 that is uh, that is more un, uh, antioxidant profile. So I, I'm not sure with removing these cytokines in the model uh, uh, we studied with uh, will reduce the superoxide annual. I think that is more by uh, the endothelial cell is stimulated uh, during the these 60 to 70 days of infection. And then we get uh, the endothelial cells get this pro-inflammatory phenotype that, that modifies the, the oxidative stress uh, inside the endothelial cells. So this gain, uh, they gain this pro-inflammatory phenotype. Okay. Um, maybe I can add a question. I was wondering, yes. Mateus, um, how at the end uh, you mentioned possible um, yes. targets for, I don't know if targets is the word, but uh, uh, to increase the superoxide uh, formation. But mm -hmm. I was wondering if you have any guess about the, 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 the signaling process, if it's by direct contact, uh, from the uh, well, or if th there's any release. Well, uh, that that is something that we are just uh, thinking about in this this year, because we we think the the source, the main source, could be by the NOx, the NTPH, because it is involved in inflammation. This this enzyme. But uh, as we didn't see any difference in the antioxidant enzymes, we also could uh, think that could be by mitochondrial metabolism because we didn't saw the, the mitochondrial isoform for SOD. So there is something there they are, that we are curious to, to find where is the, the main source of the superoxide annual. But anyway, you, you have to to have something from the external side to trigger it. So that that's what I wonder if you have any guess. No, from like the uh, exogenous source for this increase. Uh -huh. No, I, well, we did some previous results with uh, conditional medium, like taking the the medium from infected cells and put it into the control cells mm -hmm. to see if the infected medium could increase the rust productions in the control cells, but uh, the, it did not trigger the, the rust production. So I think is there some inter, inter, intercellular mechanism. Okay. Thank okay. you again, Mateus. Thank you, Professor. Um, so let's move on to the next one. I think we have Nicholas now. Hello, Nicholas. Thank you for having you here. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be making this oral presentation. My name is Nicholas and I'm from the University of Santa Cruz do Sul. 
So my research with uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy and chemometry, which in the work is represented by the data dimensionality reduction principal components analysis, PCA. And the name of the work is Determination of Flam and non flam Patients with FTIR Supervised by C-Reactive Protein. So they're considering a reference value for a C-Reactive Protein in scale 2 milligrams per liter as above this concentration, patients are inflamed and are probably chronic state and below this reference value as non inflamed patients. And why exactly did I say probably in a chronic condition? Because all patients used in our research were normal on the mammogram. Therefore, I did not have any parameter indicative uh, of an infection process that could explain an acute increase in C-reactive protein. So we thought something chronic. Uh, here in introduction, I put a standard operating scheme of a spectrometer to contextualize our listeners. But the most important thing is to understand that electromagnetic waves are emitted and, and vary their wave numbers from 650 to 4000. In the spectrum range, uh, we are able to analyze virtually all blood plasma biomolecules. So after these electromagnetic waves are emitted and interact uh, in, in the blood plasma sample, they are captured in the detector uh, and we can analyze the absorbance by wave numbers. Um, and here on the right side, a diagram about some conditions that can increase the same protein C-reactive protein like obesity, cancer, sepsis, heart disease, and other conditions. In the methods, we use seven, uh, seven to normal patients by mammogram and, and to obtain plasma by centrifugation and, and where it will be placed in the spectrometer for analysis. Subsequently, the chemometric analysis of the data is carried out with specific transformation and preprocessing, um, like in normalization, between zero and one, multiplicative scare correction to correct the scattering effect, and first derivative to correct the baseline shift and me-centering. That is a requirement for uh, for interval principal components analysis. And, and here we made a very interesting complementary analysis precisely to show the importance, the relevance of this research. Then we ap applied the, the Man Whitman U test or a student T test. Um, so we analyzed whether there was a difference in body mass index, BMI, uh, consider our reference value of say had two protein and we analyze it to whether there would be a difference in waste circumference and glucose and cholesterol uh, ADL, LDL, VLDL, TG, leptin and cell free DNA. Uh, as a result of your interval principal components analysis, the spectra region uh, in the range of 1,093 to to 983 show the best visual separation between inflammation and non inflammation patient and was represented in this top two graphic here, uh, figure A and figure B. Uh, but the, the, to the high complexity of the molecular constitution of the blood plasma, it is difficult to have an excellent visual separation. So we use hypothesis tests to help to, to uh, verify whether or not there are difference between inflammation and non inflammation patients. In this case, we get the significant p-value uh, less than 0 0.05 to principal component one and principal component five. And in graph C, it shows the average spectrum of patients cons considering inflammation and non inflammation in the spectrum region selected by the principal components analysis. Uh, therefore, inflamed patients have higher absorbances in this region, and this region where where there are several DNA and proteins bounds. And finally, in the graph D, it shows the loadings, uh, which shows uh, with wavelengths 
wavelengths had the greatest weight in GS graphical configuration of the principal components analysis. Uh, here we show which parameters that obtained significant p-values for inflammatory and non-inflammatory uh, patients. That's it. Which param parameters behave differently better in inflammatory and non-inflammatory patients? The disparent were bar mass index, waist circumference, glucose, VLDL, uh, TG, leptin, and cell-free DNA. And highlights for cell-free DNA, which is known to be increased in chronic inflammatory process, due to necrosis, apoptosis, sec secretion, evidencing or initial hypothesis that the increase in C-reactive protein is probably due to a chronic inflammatory process and not uh, acute infection process. Um, then it was found that inflammed patients had higher concentrations of cell-free DNA than non-inflammed patients. And in conclusion, FTIR, full head transform infrared, coupled with chemometric technique is proof to be an efficient screening method for inflammed and non-inflammed individuals. This allows for correlation with very anthropometric and biochemical parameters there are use of US preclinical indicative screening, assisting early diagnostic and treatment. So FTIR is simple, fast, regime free, low cost, and high sensitive and specific. Uh, that's it. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, so let me call Professor Rodrigo Chinoco. Hi, Nicholas. Uh, uh, nice, nice uh, presentation. Congratulations for your work. Well, I, I was imagining if, if your approach could discriminate uh, among several inflammatory diseases. I, I, I think your approach is interesting. For example, to say if someone has a, a, a an inflammatory disease or not, from, for example, someone is healthy, someone has a, a problem, has, a, has any evidence of an inflammatory uh, disease. But for example, do you think your approach is, apply, is applicable to other conditions, other inflammatory conditions? And if so, if can discriminate these conditions I mean, if can, if your approach uh, could be uh, valuable to discriminate among different inflammatory diseases. Uh, could you repeat in Portuguese? Você acredita que a, que a sua abordagem, a meu ver, ela funciona bem, por exemplo, se você quer saber se a pessoa tem uma evidência de uma doença inflamatória ou não. E é um método de screening rápido, mas você acha que, você, que isso pode ser aplicável? Em que medida isso pode ser aplicável para discriminar entre diferentes doenças inflamatórias? Tá? E, por exemplo, uma doença, se a pessoa tem uma doença, por exemplo, uma artrite ou uma doença mais sistêmica, o que, que você acha? Eu queria ver a sua opinião. Sim, com a espectroscopia internacional de Fourier é possível fazer essa, esse esquema classificatório com outras técnicas estatísticas. Mas aqui no caso dessa triagem entre pacientes inflamados e não inflamados, seria em, em termos de Brasil, a nível de atenção primária de saúde, um paciente que estava normal pelo hemograma, então ele não tinha nenhuma condição aguda que poderia estar aumentado a proteína C reativa, e desse modo como uma triagem, não como método diagnóstico, ele ia, o médico iria notar, ia ter um parâmetro a mais de que tem uma condição secundária de um processo inflamatório crônico. Agora, qual é, a gente não pode dizer. É simplesmente uma triagem para dizer se ele tem já trazendo um processo secundário inflamatório crônico. Agora, para diferenciar qual é, se é decorrente de uma obesidade, se é decorrente de doença cardiovascular ou outras condições inflamatórias, aí teria que usar outras uh, modulações estatísticas, né, como PLS, DA ou redes neurais artificiais. Ah, ok. Então, só para complementar, você vê como um teste de triagem, né, assim, para caracterizar um processo inflamatório. Você falou em crônico, você acha que diferencia de crônico de agudo? 
Sim, porque todos os pacientes utilizados nessa pesquisa, eles eram normais pelo hemograma, então eles não tinham nenhum, nenhuma leucocitose, não tinha leucocitose, não tinha nada do sistema imunológico que indicaria um processo infeccioso agudo. Então, como também a gente encontrou que nesses pacientes que estavam inflamados, eles tinham aumento da, da, do, do DNA livre de células, e isso é característico de processos inflamatórios crônicos, né? Anything else, Rodrigo? No, no. No? Thank you again, Nicholas. Excellent presentation. And now, I believe it's our last. Um, I'd like to call Theo. Hello. Um, Hello, Theo. First, I would like to say uh, thanks to the organizers for the uh, honorable mention. And I am an undergraduate student of biomedical sciences at the Universidade Paulista and a scientific initiation student at the Neurogenetics Lab of the uh, Universidade Federal do ABC, supervised by the professor Alexandre Hiroaki Hara. And I will present the project, uh, project entitled Deimusdol uh, 145 Triphosphate Receptor Type 1. Uh, plays important role in retinitis pigmentosa and its pharmacolog pharmacological blockage disorganizes the inflammatory response. Um, in this study, I will analyze the retina, a tissue originating from the diencephalon, which is part uh, of the central nervous system. The retina has a stratified morphological uh, structure, whose focus of the study will be on the outer nuclear layer, um, a layer that includes highly specialized cells, the photoreceptors. Um, which are necessary for the photon capture and conversion of the light stimulus into an electrochemical signal. These cells are highly susceptible to disturbance of the microenvironment and a target of studies involving homeostasis and events related to neurodegeneration and uh, neuroprotection. There are several, several retinopathies, uh, one of which is retinitis pigmentosa, um, a pathology that affects the rod subtype photoreceptor. Uh, the RP is a genetic disease that leads to a total vision loss, and it has several forms. And the prevalent subtype of the autosomal uh, recessive form uh, has a mutation in the sequence of nucleotides that encodes the enzyme phosphodesterase uh, 6 beta. And there are several mechanisms under study. Uh, in this pathology, the main ones being related to genetic and epigenetic um, alterations, apoptotic and non apoptotic cell death, oxidative and metabolic stress, alterations in, in intracellular calcium homeostasis, and inflammation response. And also regarding uh, PDE6B, uh, this enzyme is important to the rod phototransduction process, uh, whose function is to prevent the influx of intracellular calcium that lead uh, the rod to hyperparalysation in response to light. This function of this enzyme leads to an imbalance of intracellular calcium and subsequent cell death. The animal model uh, used in your work has a mutation in this enzyme. Uh, the progression of the degeneration in this animal can take uh, to one to uh, three months uh, for a total absence of photoreceptors, whereas in humans it, it can take uh, decades. In our study, we use the animal model, uh, the, the animal model known as RD1, whose initial insult starts at seven days postnatal, at 14 days uh, postnatal peak of the rod cell death, and at 25 days uh, already has uh, advanced stage of the generation of rods and gradual loss of the cones. Therefore, uh, studying this genetic model uh, of autosomal recessive uh, RP, we hypothesized that, that the IP3 uh, receptor, especially type 1, may be involved in this pathology. The IP3 R1 is responsible for releasing calcium from the internal compartment of the endoplasmic reticulum, which is the most expressed subunit in the neuronal tissues. These receptors are dependent on the binding of the IP3 uh, molecules for the release of the calcium ions. These receptors participate in homeostasis and intracellular calcium in, uh, mediating uh, signaling, such as light response, transduction, uh, inflammatory response, among other uh, important mechanisms. So this project aims to evaluate the distribution of these receptors in animals with autosomal uh, recessive uh, 
PhD is pigmentosa, and the white type control in the in important type windows of these pathology cars, as well as to analyze the effects of the pharmacolo pharmacological blockage uh, and influence on the nerve inflammation. To fulfill this aim, uh, we use the mice RD1, animal carrying the pathology, and its genetic control, uh, 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 being analyzed at the ages of 0, 7, uh, 14, and 25 days postnatal. We also use uh, the 2APB, an inhibitor of IP3R1, delivered by subretinal sub injection. Um, the intervention was performed at two different ages, at 10 and, thir and 13 days uh, postnatal, and collected at four days post-injection. These ages were chosen to access the effect of the blockage during the initial ensuit and later progression. Um, the material was analyzed by Western blotching in monofluorescence and um, multiplex assay. Uh, so, the results of immunofluorescence in animals with the RP showed a preferential accumulation of this protein in the region close to the nucleus uh, with the progression of the pathology, shown uh, from A to D. Um, <clears throat> intensity analysis of the layers uh, showed an increase of, in the outer nuclei, indicating a, a possible role of this receptor in this pathology, seen in graph E. Furthermore, the uh, Western blotch analysis showed an increase only at P7, uh, the onset of the degeneration. <clears throat> uh, compared to the, its uh, gene control in the age of P7, accumulation of this uh, receptor is, ob uh, is observed in the photorece photoreceptor segments of the white type animals, while in RD1 animals have accumulation close to the nucleus. Also, at this age, the animal RD1 demonstrates high protein levels compared to the white type. And, in P14, we observed no statistical difference between the, the models, whereas in advanced degeneration, we observed an increase in the intensity of IP3R1 in the ONL um, when compared to the wild type animal. So, moving on to the functional part of this work, we performed uh, the intervention by using an IP3R1 blocking drug in the pathology, where we used the ages at, at 10 and 13 uh, postnatal days and collected at P14 and P11 uh, <coughs> uh, postnatal days. Uh, the results obtained showed no change uh, in the thickness of the outer nuclear layer in the treated eyes of both, both, uh, of both applied ages. Uh, sorry. Um, suggestion. Um, and suggesting that this receptor uh, does not influence on cell death. With this data, we decided to evaluate the aspect of nerve inflammation by multiplex assay. Uh, interesting, we noticed that the inflammatory response was altered as shown by the heat maps, uh, indicating a decrease in the synergy or correlation of the cytokines, uh, and triggering the regulation of the inflammatory response. In addition, uh, individual uh, Individual analysis uh, demonstrated the decrease in the cytokines in interleukin 10, 13, 11, and TNF. Uh, in summary, our work indicates that IP3R1 protein can translocate during uh, disease progression, which may indicate an important role in the degeneration. Furthermore, its pharmacological blockage did not change ONL, uh, ONL morphometry, but caused uh, disorganization of the inflammatory response possibly by uh, indicating an alteration at the molecular level of the inflammatory cascades, such as reactive gliosis and microglial activation. And I would like to say thanks to my team at the Neurogenetics Labs, uh, especially to Maridia, Maridia, Gabrielli and Giulia, and thanks to the organization committee. Thank you, Theo. Um... Okay, Rodrigo. So, nice talk, Tell Congratulations for your work. Well, why do you use uh, black, six, black six mice as a white type mice to C3HEJ mice? Uh, the the C3HEJ mice are TLR4 deficient. Naturally, it's a 
a, a spontaneous mutation that abolishes the the TLR4 signaling in the HAJ mice. But why do you compare these mice with black six mice? They are genetically different. They, they don't have the same background uh, beyond the, the, the TLR4 deficiency. Why did you compare the... Um, first, uh, thanks for the question. And I think it's uh, the models are closed, uh, closed by genetics. I don't uh, know exactly what, but uh, I just need to learn more about the models. I, I suggest you to use uh, to use uh, really uh, TLR for knockout mice in the black six background. For example, Dr. Gazinelli has these animals in, in Rio. Uh, I think it's Zamboni in NUSP has the, these animals. Marcelo Bosa has these animals. Maria Bello in the Department of Immunology here in the, the UFRJ. So you can compare re really the, the same background uh, only with animal on, with animals only differing by the TLR4 deficiency or not. But anyway, what's the, the role of TLR4 in your model? Because you use uh, 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 um, you use mice that are, that are deficient in TLR4. What's the, the the role of TLR in your model? It's a it's a, an experimental model of uh, uh, how can I say? Uh, Retin lesion. Um, sorry, can you can you uh, speak the last part in Portuguese? I'm sorry, I can understand uh, clearly. Porque você usa o HJ como modelo porque ele é deficiente de TLR4. O TLR4 é um modelo. Por exemplo, camundongos deficientes de TLR4 desenvolvem é, é, lesão na retina. O TLR4 tem papel. Que eu fiquei intrigado com isso. Então, uh, nós pretendemos estudar essa parte também, né? A gente tem o que é necessário no laboratório para fazer uh, estudo dessa questão, inclusive é um dos próximos passos, né? Além da caracterização das, das, das células, uh, uh, das células da glia, né? Na retina, tanto com o tratamento ou sem o tratamento, uh, a gente também uh, pretende fazer cultura primária, né? Uh, tanto do animal 657 como do C3H para o estudo do TLR4 deficiente também. A princípio, o foco do uso do C3H é porque ele tem a retinose pigmentar, né? E ele é considerado o, o, o RD1, né? Então, ele tem essa degeneração muito rápida, né? Uma progressão da degeneração muito rápida e era o um modelo disponível também que é pela USP aqui, né? Então, foi mais uh, esse o motivo da escolha do modelo animal. Ah, ok. So, so C3H, R, H, E, J, R is develop spontaneously neurodegeneration on the retin. Ah, I, I, yes. I understand it. Okay. Yes. And they are very commonly used in the works. Né? Uh, they have a, a progression fast uh, compared to the other, other uh, autosomal uh, recessive retinitis pigmentosa animal models. And, and that's why we use them. Ah, okay. So uh, thank you all again. Maybe if, if everyone could uh, uh, appear so that we can say goodbye to the audience and congratulate you all. Uh, it was a very nice uh, session we had. Thank you all for being here. I think you all um, you all presented excellent work, so my congratulations to you and to your team. Um, really very happy about it, okay? Um, um, we'll have a award, uh, 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 a prize, uh, and it will be announced on Wednesday, so uh, at the end of the workshop. So let's wait until there, okay? So for now, congratulations to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Us. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.
Thanks. Bye. <laughs>